Hello and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, here with my co-host, Bethany Ruff. Hello, hello. And we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Dr. Irene Davis is the founding director of the Spalding National Running Center at Harvard Medical School. She is a professor emeritus in physical therapy at the University of Delaware, where she served on the faculty for over 20 years. Dr. Davis' research had focused on the relationship between lower extremity structure, mechanics, and injury. She is interested in the mechanics of barefoot running and its effect on injury rates, and is a barefoot runner herself. Along with gait analysis, her research encompasses dynamic imaging and modeling. Dr. Davis has given nearly 300 lectures both nationally and internationally, and has authored over 100 publications on the topic of lower extremity mechanics during running. She is the former president of the American Society of Biomechanics and has been featured on ABC World News Tonight, Good Morning America, Discovery, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Parade, Time Magazine, among others. Dr. Irene Davis, it's such a pleasure to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Thank you, Casey and Bethany. It's great to be here. Absolutely. We have followed your work for a very long time. We had a former guest um, that we were fortunate to interview, Danny Dreyer, who is a wonderful author of Chi Running. And one of my favorite stories from his book was when he walked into a store to buy some running shoes and the lady in San Francisco was Chinese and she just kind of looked at him like, you, you Westerners are so bizarre, like, like you're, all you're doing is making your feet stupid by using these shoes. <laughs> I thought that was so well said. Definitely. Yeah, I'm surprised. You know, in a running shoe store, people are usually trying to sell all of the technology. So that's, that's always uh, encouraging to hear. I think it was like in the 70s or 80s. It was a very long time ago. Oh, okay. (laughs) Well, so we're super curious to talk to you. When did you know that you wanted to get into biomechanics? Oh, my gosh. You know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I first got out of high school and went to college. I thought I was going to be an FBI agent, but then learned that women weren't allowed in the FBI. So um, I guess I became, you know, a a detective in another way. I mean, I went on to, to do physical therapy and then uh, a PhD in biomechanics. And, you know, and, and, and as I said, in a way, I'm a- investigating things and problem solving and figure things out, but from a different perspective. So I'm really interested in figuring out why people get injured and trying to um, teach people to move in a way that's closer to the way that we evolved to move. Mm. Where did your interest um, become the foot itself? Well, you know, I mean, my interest is really the whole lower extremity, and I've done research in in lower extremity mechanics. The foot is the very first um, interaction with the ground, um, and I think that the foot has been highly underappreciated. Um, and that was really brought out when one of the more recent guidelines in the in my practice, the American Physical Therapy Association, put out guidelines for the treatment of plantar fasciitis, which is a foot related problem. And they had all kinds of great recommendations, including things like ultrasound and icing and orthotics and different modalities and night splints, et cetera. But the one thing that they didn't include was foot strengthening. And in every other guideline they've ever put out, whether it be knee, ankle, you know, shoulder, strengthening's always been a part of that. Um, and I really f- found that to be really um, alarming in a sense, because it, it meant that that our profession doesn't even appreciate how many muscles are on the foot and how important those muscles are to foot function. Oh, I could not agree more. I work in the field of structural integration, particularly manual therapy, and I find the exact same thing. Just for our listeners, because I feel like it's so misunderstood, can you distinguish the differences between itis versus osis versus opathy? Hmm, so itis is an inflammation of... Osis is, opathy is definitely just a uh, disruption of something. I, you know, I'm trying to remember what osis is. Degeneration, maybe? Maybe, maybe that, yeah. I guess that is it. I don't really use that that often. It's mostly the itises and the opathies. And a lot of the itises have been now sort of termed opathies. So instead of plantar fasciitis, it's plantar fasciopathy um, because it, it involves more than just an inflammation. Gotcha. Thank you so much for making that clarification. I'm curious, how long as humans have we been um, bipedal and up and walking around? Well, I can tell you that we've been running for two million years and we've been walking for even longer than that. Um, And so we are really well designed to be up on two feet and to um, have structures that allow us to tolerate the loads of walking and running. 
we've been doing it for a really long time. Mm, wow. When you think about the footwear that we have today, the modern footwear, it's only 50 years old. So if you look at 50, if we just talk about running, you look at 50 over 2 million, that's the percentage of time in our running history that we've been wearing supportive shoes. Interesting. So when did we first see the, the you know, first examples of, of footwear, the way that people were wearing them? Um, I think the very first um, examples of footwear that we have date back 10,000 years, and they were developed out of what's called sagebrush bark, which is... <clears throat> basically it's basically came from from the woods and they um they created a flat bed and then they used um some of that to strap it on so ties to strap it on the top of the foot very much like a kind of like a harachi sandal um they're they believe there was footwear before then um and there have been visual pic, pic, uh, pictures of them but these were the first ones that they ha have actually found um but basically this footwear protected the bottom surface of the foot and that was it so it wasn't there to cushion or to support the foot. Mm, was it Nike branded? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not so much. So what are some of the differences between, <laughs> you know, the, the footwear that's just protecting the bottom of the foot versus some of the modern day footwear that we use today? Oh my God. <laughs> that, I mean, they're, they're like night and day. So the footwear that just protects the bottom of the foot requires the foot to do the cushioning and the support as it, as it accepts the loads of walking and running. Whereas the modern footwear of today supports the foot. It supports the arch. It supports the back of the heel. Um, there are supports um, for, against pronation and supination by plastic pieces where the uh, outer sole and the upper connect. Um, they have uh, a midsole that, that adds all kinds of cushioning. And then they have, you know, different gimmicks that I'm not sure what they do, but, you know, we've got anatomical arches and all kinds of gimmicks that try to, um, to, to improve someone's comfort and performance. But, you know, I really think that all of that is really not needed because if you think about it, we evolved to walk and run barefoot. So we were adapted with every single bit of support and cushioning that we need, um, if, and, and the only real reason that we need footwear is really to protect the bottom of our feet like we did 10,000 years ago. So if we kind of take that up the kinetic chain to the knee and then the hip and I guess all the way up to the shoulders and head placement, how can you describe how the stiffening of the leg muscle has to work when the foot has cushion underneath versus how the softening of the leg muscle works without cushion? Yeah, that's a really good question, Bethany, because I think a lot of people don't appreciate that we have this incredible ability in our leg spring to modulate its stiffness. So some people will say, well, you know, it's fine to be running on grass without any cushioning, but what about when you get on concrete? Well, if you look at even the Tamahumata runners of the Copper Canyons of Mexico, they were running on pretty hard packed surfaces and they had, basically they were running on discarded automobile tires that they cut and made into sandals with some rawhide straps to keep them on the foot. Very much like those, those uh, sagebrush sandals that I, I mentioned earlier. So, you know, we were running on very hard packed surfaces as well. We've run on hard surfaces, we've run on so soft surfaces. And we're adapted to be able to do that across a range of surfaces. So when you come in contact with a soft surface, like if you're going to, let's say you're jumping off of a step that, you know, maybe a 12 inch step and you're going to land on sand, you're going to stiffen your leg because if your leg's really soft, you're just going to collapse into that sand. But if you're going to jump off that same 12 inch curb and land on concrete, you're going to flex your ankles, your knees and your hips because you're going to try to help soften that so that you have this overall system stiffness. And that's what we do. So when you go out and you run, if people ask me, should you, you know, just train in grass? There's nothing wrong with training in grass as long as you're going to be running in grass all the time because you're going to develop a stiff leg gait. And that's okay for grass. Um, and if you're going to run in pavement, you at least should spend some of your time, a significant amount of your time, training on pavement so you train your leg to be soft. And what happens is, <clears throat> and people who run with cushioned shoes, they run on hard pavement, they run in cushioned shoes. And when that cushion starts to deteriorate, 
say, four to 500 miles. You hear about that number. And then all of a sudden people's, you know, injuries start to tweak, their knee starts to tweak, whatever it is that is their typical problem. It's because they've lost the cushioning characteristics of the shoe and they don't have the cushioning characteristics innately. When you run in a minimal shoe, you train yourself because you don't have any cushioning to do that cushioning. And so you don't rely on the cushioning or support of the shoe your body's doing that. And therefore you don't have to worry about shoes wearing out because you know, you basically can run the shoe until it has a hole in the bottom of it. In fact, there's some, there's one shoe company, um, this is zero shoes. They actually guarantee their soles for 5,000 miles. So it's a very different, you know, different characteristic of running, whether you're running on hard and soft surfaces. And when you train your leg to do that, you can go across many surfaces. That's brilliant. So in your opinion and what you've seen in clinical research and with your own patients over the years, do you believe that if we strike that and reverse it, that you can correct most knee and hip dysfunctions by correcting the foot and the type of footwear the foot functions in? I think that we can make a dent in it. I'm not going to say that all problems are related to the foot, um, but I think a lot of our problems are related to this general idea of the mismatch theory of evolution. So if we look at the foot, specific to your question, I do believe that when your foot is not doing its job, it can translate to problems up at the knee um, and further up. Um, certainly if you're running with cushioned shoes, you most likely 95% of recreational distance runners in traditional shoes land on their heel. And when you land on your heel, you get an impact peak and that impact peak is and that, that sort of impact transient, um, specifically the rate of loading of that, uh, is related to knee problems. So just by the way that you land, when you land with a pair of cushioned shoes because they promote a rear foot strike pattern, it sets you up for knee-related issues. Um, and if you transition someone to a forefoot strike pattern, you actually shift the load from the knee to the ankle, the calf and the Achilles, which is where I think it's supposed to be. Um, and it reduces the knee loading and reduces the risk for knee injuries. And when you think about it, knee injuries are the number one injury that runners sustain. So yes, I think that the foot can have play a role. Now, I'm going to take it up from the foot and say that I think in terms of the mismatch theory, what you're probably doing, what I'm doing right now, I'm sitting. So when you're sitting, right, and especially if you're not sitting upright and and sitting with good posture, you basically get a lot of extra support and cushioning from this, the way we sit. Some of these, think about a Barco lounger, for example. Um, and so you lose some of the stability of your core. And we have deconditioned our core, just like we've deconditioned our feet with, with supportive cushioned shoes. All the sitting we've done, especially in some of the, the, the cushioned seat, sitting that we, we often employ, has further resulted in weakness of this core musculature. When you have weakness of the core musculature, then the lower extremities don't function well. And we've shown that co weak cores are related to malalignments of the knee, the lower extremity that can relate to knee problems. So a knee problem can actually come from the foot up or from the hip down. Hmm, interesting. What are other surprising injuries that people sustain with running that people wouldn't normally think about? Well, one of them that I think people don't often think about is plantar fasciitis, um, that that impact force and that, you know, high rate of loading actually loads all of the structures in a, a, a faster than normal rate. So when you're landing and your arch comes down, that stretches the plantar fascia. And if that rate is really high, that plantar fascia is going to be stretched at a very high rate. And that can relate to um, plantar fascia injuries. Um, certainly even things like back injuries because of the impact. When you land on the ground, you um, have a, 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 t a shock wave that travels from your foot to your head. And at your head, it needs to be one to two Gs, regardless of where it starts at your foot, because you don't want a shaken brain syndrome, right? So it has to just for protection of our brain. So our body is this big filter. So if you land with, let's say, 10 Gs at your foot, then you've got to attenuate eight or nine of them before it gets to the head. That means all through the joints, they have to attenuate that, that, that shock. Um, if you land with five Gs, now you only have to attenuate 
three to four of them. Do you see what I mean? So the softer you land, the less your body has to attenuate those loads. If you can reduce the loads that are going through your back, then that can certainly help with back-related injuries. And if you have really high impacts, it can translate up to the back. Thank you so much for explaining that. Can we talk a little bit about the function of the big toe? I feel like in my work, both Pilates and structural integration, that we have hammer toes, bunions, immobility, bone growth, just kind of a lack of awareness over that really, really strong and crucial element of the foot. I, yeah, Bethany, you're asking such great pointed questions. Um, you know, the big toe and actually all of the toes, even the little toe should be able to spread. You know, if your listeners right now have their shoes off, I would really challenge them to look at their feet. I'm doing it to myself right now and spread your toes. You should be able to abduct or move your big little toe out and your big toe out. And you should see space between every single one of your toes. And then you should be able to bring them together and squeeze. So I really think it's important for all of the toes because they all are really active in propulsion, especially during walking and running. Now, the big toe in particular is really important. Abduction, which is means an outward movement of that toe or towards your midline, I guess is another way to think of it, um, and flexion are important for maintaining the arch of the foot. And when that, fo- when that muscle, when that big toe is not doing that, the arch has a tendency to collapse. If you don't work the abductors, moving that toe out from the other toes, then it's going to start to drift inward. And you start to get that hallux valgus or that bunion deformity, that, that angle that you see in some people. And sometimes the toe even crosses over the other toe. So the muscle becomes weak and that, then it gets into a very ineffective position to be able to, uh, to be able to contract. So once it starts getting into, you know, moving closer and closer and crossing the other toe, there's a length tension problem there and it has a difficult time contracting. And so it ends up you know, and being a, a, a continually spiraling kind of problem. Um, so the big toes are very important, but I think all of the toes are very important. So along those same lines, I've heard another podcast that you've been on, uh, your description of the short foot exercise. Can you take our listeners through a little practice of that? Sure. So um, it's good to start this when you're sitting um, and just, you know, with your knees, your hips at 90 degrees and your knees at 90 degrees and your ankles at 90 degrees. So you're just sitting there um, with your feet on the ground. And what you do is you actually press your, your um, toes, your big toe and your, your lateral toes downward, but you don't flex them. That's another exercise and that's fine. But for this particular exercise, you want to try to stiffen them and press them into the ground. It's hard because you have a tendency to want to bring the flexors in. They flex a little bit. It's okay. But try to keep them as straight as possible. And then you draw the the ball of your foot back towards your heel um, and basically raises the arch and makes the foot shorter. It's why it's called the short foot exercise. It's also called doming because you're making your arch into a dome. And... um, and then you hold it. Um, and if you try that just once and you start to get cramping, you've got some weakness in your feet. So it's good to start that both in sitting and then you can you can do it in standing. You can do it with two feet on the ground. You can try to do it with one foot on the ground. And then we progress those exercises to doming and hopping. So that you're doming, you do that dome and then you do a little hop and you hold that dome when you land and you do it on two feet. Then you do it on one foot. Then you do it off a step with two feet, then you do it off of one foot, then you, then you try some running like step to step. And again, thinking about activating those muscles. We try to get our patients to think about doming whenever they're standing. And we, we have something called active standing and Beth, Bethany, you're probably aware of this, but basically what active standing is you stand with your feet pointed straight ahead, unless you really, someone's really got some, you know, alignment issues that point them in a different way. But you try to get them straight ahead and then you have them dome, you have them contract their glutes, and you also have them contract their lower abdominals. So they pull their navel up towards their ribs, right? And squeeze their glutes, pull the shoulders back, head and neck come back on like on a drawer, and you stand there. And that is what we call active standing. And if you do it enough, it becomes your new position. You start to develop you know, a habitual pattern of standing in that position. Um, 
at a minimum, we try to get people to think about doming whenever they're in line. Like if you're in the grocery line, dome, 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 just dome when you're standing to try to get those muscles activated. Dome, don't foam. <laughs> don't, yes, that's right. Dome, no, dome, don't foam. <laughs> it's really amazing when you start to kind of be more conscious of your own posture. Then you look around and see like how much trouble most people are in when they're not aware of this stuff. It's crazy. It is. And that's why it's great to do this in front of a mirror, because most people think when you start to change their position, like, for example, if someone um, is standing with their foot like a duck, right, way out in the outside or pigeon toed and you straighten it, like if someone is pigeon toed and you straighten it, just straighten it. They feel like it's way out like a duck. Um, it's just this whole perception. Their muscles are tightened in a certain way. So getting them in front of a mirror and showing them, you know, this is what neutral standing looks like. Uh, and, and kind of training them. They have to kind of retrain their muscles. I see that multiple times a day. And it's, it is so interesting that their interoception and proprioception with the floor just feels so off. Um, so to that point, before we move on from foot structure, can you talk a little bit about the sub talar joint? I've once ref uh, heard it referred to as the steering wheel for the rest of the leg. And I, I find that with most clients that have, you know, too much turnout or over pronation, collapsing the arch in, they're going to have issues as far as the weight distribution on the inside and outside of the heel. So what is ideal when you're standing? Well, I think what's ideal is that you're in a neutral position, that your talus is neither pointing, you know, uh, project. It's certainly you don't want your talus projecting outward. You don't want to see the talus. The talus should be, there should be a nice articulation um, with the tibia, the tibia and the talus um, on both sides of the joint. So if, you, if you're standing and you put your fingers at the talo, tibial talar joint, um, or the, you're talking about the subtalar, sorry, you're talking about subtalar joint. So if you put your fingers between the talus and the calcaneus, that's your subtalar joint. You put your fingers on either side of that, you should feel, you know, the projections of the talus equally on both sides when someone's standing. And you can have them roll in a little and roll out a little and get them into that neutral position. And, and that's a good position to function from. And with your clients or patients, is it common that you see that one foot is not necessarily screwed on the same as the opposite foot? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, sometimes, most of the time we see very similar structural deviations with one side maybe being a little worse than the other. That's probably more typical, but I have seen people who are more pronated on one side, more supinated on the other side. So you can see that for sure. In your opinion, is it ever too late in someone's life to start making those structural or functional changes? No, I don't think it's ever too late. Um, I think that we lose our plasticity as we age. So it's harder to make changes when you're older than when you're younger, but that doesn't mean you can't make changes. It just means that maybe the degree of the change that you're able to make or the speed of the change that you'd like to make is going to be slower. But I, we, we, we retain that plasticity throughout our whole life. It's just that it does slowly decrease as we age. Mm. I think a lot of people too are maybe aware of this, but are also kind of intimidated. You know, they don't want to, for me personally, I didn't want to throw away all my other shoes that I spent so much money on. Um, and I didn't understand the benefits at the time, but what things can people start doing besides those exercises with their footwear to start transitioning over to a healthier way of walking or running? Well, um, running is very different. So let's talk about walking first. It's actually fairly easy to transition from, you know, supportive cushion shoes to minimal shoes and walking because the loads are less, the risk is less in terms of, you know, overloading a tissue and causing an injury. Um, but again, if somebody's in orthotics, um, you're going to have to wean out of the orthotics first and then, um, and then start to wean into the, the minimal shoes. And if you've had a history of some kind of foot injury, like let's say plantar fasciitis, they want to take it a little bit slower. And we also uh, um, recommend that people do the doming exercises and, and heel raises to try to strengthen those muscles as they're making the transition. And people usually are able to do it as long as they don't take a pair of minimal shoes and then go out and walk five miles the first time. Usually people can transition into them pretty easily. Um, there was this, you know, we've done some work um, with Sarah Ridge's group looking at just walking in minimal shoes and you get a significant increase in the size of the cross-sectional area 
of the muscles of the arch. And just let me remind the view that your listeners that there are 10 muscles or, or, or um, oriented in four layers in just in your arch. And those are muscles that originate and insert in the foot. There are 10 of them. So you can imagine there's, there's a lot of, there's meat underneath there. People don't think about the foot as being a meaty thing, but it, it does have some meat to it. The other muscles that go down into the foot are called extrinsic. Those are intrinsic muscles if they originate and insert in the foot. But the extrinsic muscles start outside the leg, like in the calf, and then it's tenderness as it comes across the foot. So they don't really contribute to the meat of the foot, but they, they contribute to the stability of the foot. But it's important to, you know, to try to maybe do some strengthening along with that, especially if you want to do a little faster sort of progression um, to a minimal shoe in walking. The study that we did, we compared foot strengthening to walking in a minimal shoe. And we took eight weeks to progress them up to replacing their walking with uh, regular shoes to walking in minimal shoes against an eight week foot strengthening program. And in three of the four muscles that we focused on, there was no difference between the increase in the size. Um, in one muscle, they both incre they increased in, in the two conditions. So we had a control group where there was no increase. Um, but the foot strengthening did cause, resulted in a greater increase in just one of the four muscles. But in general, walking in minimal shoes is just as efficacious as a foot strengthening program. So by combining them, you're just giving yourself a little bit more insurance. Wow. Running is a little bit harder. Um, and it, it requires, because the demands are higher, right? Um, so it requires really making sure that you do those foot strengthening exercises and single leg heel raises and, um, and really start very slow and, and progress slowly. Just because the forces are, the load rates are at least two times higher. The forces are two times higher. Um, the demands are greater on the foot and the lower leg. So it's important not to do that too quickly. And this is honestly where minimal footwear got their bad name. It was back probably about 10 years ago when they came out and people were just raving about them and putting them on and re just replacing them, their other shoes with these minimal shoes and running the same mileage that they were running. And of course they're gonna break down. And one of the more serious injuries that are associated with running in minimal shoes is a metatarsal stress fracture. And when you think about it, it the, it's the muscles that actually prevent the, the loading of the metatarsals. The muscles are underneath and they help shield the metatarsals and help reduce the bending strain on them. And when they're not strong and you add a load to it, they aren't protecting them as much and there's greater strain. So it's important. Um, doesn't mean, I think that we're, we were, I still believe we were designed, we were adapted to run in the ball of our foot. But I think when you have spent a long time in cushioned shoes and landing on your heel, you need to spend some time getting your foot and lower leg ready and slowly adapting to that new pattern. Can you talk to us a little bit about how the gait should modify based on grade changes? For example, when you're walking or running uphill, the foot is kind of pre-dorsiflexed. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're running uphill, you have a, ten in fact, I have a lot of people that tell me patients that they don't have pain running uphill, but they have pain running downhill. Let's say it's knee pain. Part of that is when you run uphill, you're really pretty much running on the ball of your foot. Um, whereas when you're running downhill, it's hard to land on the ball of your foot running downhill. Um, and so the grade definitely does change your dorsiflexion. If you're walking, then you're going to just be walking with more you know, more dorsiflexion as you're going up and less dorsiflexion as going down. So it just loads that, that foot a little bit differently. I love the protocol that you gave um, in an episode that I listened to, and I think it would be really helpful for our listeners as well. I believe you said going out for, if you're training to start running for a 30 minute run, you're doing yeah. a run one minute and then you're, you know, walking yeah. the other nine. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. This is just one example. There are lots of them. You can get on the internet and find all kinds of transition programs. I actually took this from Stuart Warden, who is uh, uh, one of my colleagues and really kind of a rock star in the area of bone. And this is a return from a stress fracture protocol that he put together. But I think it really, uh, I use it for returning um, to, to run or to um, transitioning. So basically what you do is you you start to walk in the minimal shoes and you build up to 30 minutes. And once you can build up to 30 minutes, then you start to take that 30 minutes into three 10 minute blocks. 
And the first 10 minute block, the first day that you're running, you run one minute and you walk nine, run one, walk nine, run one, walk nine. And then day two, you may go run two, walk eight, do that three times. Day three, you may take a day off, see how you feel. If you're a little sore, you may stay at the level you were the time before. If not, you can increase it. It's very much, um, you, you progress based on your own symptoms. So it really should be personalized to how you're feeling. You should not push it if it's if you're sore. And then um, once you have completely replaced your walking with running, then you can start to you know increase a little bit your speed because um, you like to try to keep the speed low at, at, when you're doing this transition. Because again, it's going to load the foot and lower leg more. Um, and then you can start to add a little bit more um, ver- variety to it, some hills. You might want to add some speed workouts as you get a little farther along. But it's a good way to get started, and it should be based on your symptoms. Mm. We've been talking a little bit about speed and the difference between running and walking. I remember hearing this somewhere. I'm, I'm not sure where. Maybe it was the book Go Wild. But that humans are unique in that we can be very efficient at a lot of different speeds. We can walk really efficiently. We can trot. We can you know, run. We can sprint where other animals have to specialize at a certain speed. Is that true? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't heard that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it were true. Um, I know that we are really very good endurance runners. We're not really good fast runners. We're probably the slowest in the animal kingdom or among the slowest in the animal kingdom. Um, The reason that we're really good endurance runners is because we can pant off our heat, we sweat, um, and we can breathe independent of our foot strikes. So when we were hunting kudu, they're big animals and they would run in big curds. And, um, you know, this was before we had spears to be able to try to, you know, um, get them with a spear. We had to actually hunt them down to exhaustion. So what what the um, these individuals would do, these hunters would do, is they would carve one out of the herd because you'd have to keep track of them because they couldn't keep up with them. And then you would just run them into exhaustion. And then once the – because the animal – after a while, they can't, they can only take one breath for every step because their gut slashed into their diaphragm. They're just big, heavy animals. And so they can't pant off their heat and they don't sweat. So the, um, so that's why we're really good at endurance running is it was important for us for survival. And, and we continue, we remain to be, I mean, I know that there are some people that run very, very fast, but in the, in the whole big scheme of things and animals, we're not super fast. Mm, that's super interesting. How does that apply to different sports that we can be playing that maybe we didn't evolve with? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, you know, the thing about running that's so unique is that we did evolve to do it, right? And I always consider running to be an activity of daily living. I don't really think think of it as a sport. I mean, we can take it to a sport level. I agree. But I, you know, even from a PT standpoint, you know, a lot of times it's harder to get insurance companies to reimburse for running, but running is one of those skills that we should be able to do. We have to run after our kids. We have to run after the the train. You have to run across the street. You got to run away from the boogeyman. You learn how to do it. You know, uh, nobody teaches you. You learn how to run, right? And so, you know, running is something I think that um, is very innate and very natural. And so that's why I think we can do it without any, we, we, were, we adapted to do it without any help at all. Now, take something else like skiing, right? Skiing is not something, I'm not, I'm not dissing the sport. I'm just saying it's not something we evolved to do. And so we need other equipment to help us to do it, right? So to stabilize our ankles. Although what happens is all the stress goes to knees and people blow their ACLs. But, um, but it's the same with the even sports that uh, perhaps require more um, like ice skating, right? We need something to be able to get across the ice. But, you know, people ask me about field sports, but there are some third world countries that still play soccer barefoot. Um, certainly you want to protect your feet, so this might be a reason to have them. But there, are lots of, there were lots of um, individuals uh, uh, historically who have played these sports barefoot. Um, you think about basketball, right? And, you know, it used to be Chuck Taylors and now these things are like, you know, almost like ski boots and people are getting injured, um, further up. So, 
I just think that we need to let our body move the way it's supposed to move, the way it was adapted to move. And that if we do that, that we're going to have to be at the le- the least risk for injury. So while we did evolve to run, what are your opinions on treadmill running while we have not innately adapted to the surface moving out from under us? Good question. So um, we did do some studies looking at the difference between treadmill running and overground running, right? Just to see if the mechanics are different because I really expected that they would be different. Now, just mind you, I our overground running was running along a lab because we also wanted to look at, we had a 3D motion analysis system. We also looked at forces. Um, but what we found, which was, I was pretty surprised about, is that there's really a lot of similarities between the mechanics of overground and treadmill running, despite the fact that the treadmill belt moves underneath you. So your ground reaction forces are almost identical, whether you're running overground or the treadmill's running underneath you. Now, one of the things we didn't look at is the muscle activity that goes along with that. And it may be that that is different and that's that accounts for some of the differences that you feel. But the thing about treadmill running is that I think, and I don't have any data on this, there are some people that love it. And they uh, there's a few, there's a very small slice of the running community that all they want to run on is treadmills. It's hard to believe. <laughs> most of them hate treadmills and most won't really would rather run outside. That's insane. Treadmill, I know it is insane, but I swear there are some people. So um, when you run on a treadmill, the variability is going to be less than the variability of loading when you're outside, right? So when you're outside, you, you have all kinds you got curbs and all kinds of things, even if you're not on trails. Obviously, trails are probably the best, but if you're not on trails, you still have a lot of things that can help distribute the load because these injuries, remember, are overuse injuries. And if you load the low extremity exactly the same way every single time, that's going to cause a problem. I think this is why, uh, I get off the track for a minute, barefoot runners, they have more variability in their landing pattern than shod runners because runners in shoes don't have that sensory input and they land the same way every single time. A barefoot runner has the sensory input. They don't want to load their foot the same way every single time. They change it. And when you change the way you load your foot, guess what? It changes the way things get loaded all the way up the chain. So this is sort of natural ability to vary the loading all the way up um, the chain of the musculoskeletal system. Um, But back to treadmill and, and, um, and overground running. So in treadmill running, the variability is is uh, is this not different, um, is more consistent, and also you're always running the same speed. Whereas when you go outside, if you look at your watch and you actually track it, you're going to be going up and your speed's going to be going up and down and up and down and up and down, right? You have a, a you have an average speed, but you change it, and you actually adapt your speed depending on your level of fatigue. Whereas on a treadmill, you don't, unless you actually try to you know, just shift the, the speed down. So there are definitely differences in treadmill versus outside running. I think the best running for people really is trail. Thank you so much for describing all of that. I think it's just, it's fascinating if you take your shoes and socks off to even look at the bottoms of your feet, if you ever go barefoot and just notice where the calluses are developing and how they can be different on right versus left. You can tell, so I always say, we always look at people's footwear and we look at how they wear. That's one of the first things I do when I'm in a hit, when I'm taking a history, because it already gives me insight into what I'm going to see when they hop on the treadmill. It's kind of the same with the feet, right? Because the feet, the calluses in your feet, especially if you're on barefoot, actually develop in response to the stresses that it is experiencing. I had a really interesting, I tell this story a lot. It, my husband and I were in, um, I was down in Delaware at the time and it was fall and it was, a, it was chilly out. Um, it was in November and we were running a, a, a loop that was a one mile loop and we were running it four times. And I said, yeah, I'm going to put my shoes on because it was cold. And my husband said, no, I'm, I'm going to go barefoot. And I go, I think you should put your shoes on. He goes, no, I'm going to go barefoot. And, you know, you know when they say, that, I'm not going <laughs> to change your mind. So go ahead, go barefoot. So we're running, right? And he, and I run slow. He got, we got lapped, right, by a guy. And so he didn't like that. So he went faster than he normally runs, try to catch up with the guy. He didn't want to be lapped. And um, so he gets to the car first. So he, I see him when I get to the car, he's sitting in the driver's seat, but his foot's hanging out and it's bleeding. And I looked at it and he had run 
a full thickness defect, like circle of skin off of the big toe of one of his feet, uh, the pad, the, the big toe pad, not the toe, but the ball of the foot. He'd, the whole skin was gone, but he was cold and he didn't feel it, right? So in the cold, when you don't feel it, you don't change and adapt your your pattern. This is the whole variability thing. I think he just didn't have any feeling because it was, was pretty cold. And so he just kept running the same way. And it's probably his tendency to run that way. If there were, if it weren't so cold and he had feeling, because we'd run barefoot before too, he never did that, then he wouldn't have had that problem. And I think this is what happens with shoes. They numb us to the, the sensory input that we get when we're barefoot. So I encourage people to, you know, to, to spend time barefoot, even if they don't want to run, even walking barefoot and get that sensory input that we're meant to have. Hopefully he learned his lesson from that one. He did. He did. So along the same line, as far as protection mechanisms that the body basically lays down without our conscious approval, can we talk a little bit about um, heel spurs or bone spurs in general, how and why the body lays down those osteoblasts, if it's possible to recycle them out, anything that the listener can do if they notice that they have those going on in their feet? Yeah, so I mean, some of the most, co- the most common place for a bone spur is really at the um, the calcaneal tubercle uh, on the bottom of the foot, more typically the medial, there's a medial and lateral calcaneal tubercle. These are just little bumps in the calcaneus in the bottom of your foot. It's where the plantar fascia attaches. And if you get a chronic tugging of that, it, with time, the bone starts to spur, it starts to pull and become, you know, kind of pointy in a sense. Um, and some people, be- it, there's there's really a, a, a two thoughts on this. Some people believe that it causes pain. There are others that believe it doesn't cause pain. Um, I've seen people get the spurs removed and they still have pain. So I I question whether these are a cause of pain or not. They're an adaptive response. You can see the same thing in the Achilles where the Achilles attaches to the back of the calcaneus. You can get a spur there as well. Um, Those tend to be problematic because your your shoe tends to wear, rub back and forth on that. And so sometimes removing that is helpful. You've done some interesting research lately with a group in Brazil. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I I haven't done direct research with the group in Brazil. I there's a there's a woman who I have been um, closely uh, following, and we we speak on the we've done panel discussions together. Her name is Bel Seco. We just wrote a paper. Uh, she was one of the co-authors on a paper, which I can talk about in a minute. But um, I haven't actually directly done research with her. She actually did send up two of her PhD students to spend a year in the lab with me, and we did research with them some minimal footwear work. But what Belle has done, and this I think is pretty remarkable, as she is showing how minimal footwear can be beneficial to people who are older and have pathology. Um, And I think this is really important. A lot of people think about minimal footwear as being something for running. Um, And of course, it is more of what I've studied, but I believe minimal footwear should start from the minute you you put shoes on your feet to the minute you take shoes off the last time. Um, I really think that, that that's really the range. And her work has shown that um, in women who had neo she randomized them into a standard shoe and a minimal shoe. After six months, they had significant reductions in their abnormal um, knee mechanics, which is related to the neo As well, they had significant reduction in their pain, improvement in their function, um, and a reduction in their pain medication compared to the group that just continued to walk in the regular shoes. There was no exercise program, no other intervention. I think that's pretty powerful. So um, I'm just really excited about the work that she's doing. She's also advocating for minimal footwear in people with diabetes, not pre-peripheral neuropathy. So before you start to lose sensation and with the idea that if you can get them in minimal shoes before that pathology, and sometimes it's decades before that comes on, you can keep the muscles of the foot strong because one of the problems with diabetes is that you start to get an imbalance in the muscles and then you get foot deformities and those foot deformities cause increased pressures under the metatarsal heads, which end up with sores that don't heal. And then you have amputation. So, um, I'm really excited about the work that she's doing, uh, in that area. Mm, That's great. Good chance to, um, call out some of your favorite companies. What, what are some of your favorite brands of minimal shoes that you recommend to people? Yep. So, um, I am very shoe agnostic and I I try to stay that way because I love them all. Um, so I'm not going to really say a favorite brand. There's lots of shoes out there. 
Um, and I, and I, you know, I, I, I'm grateful to them that they have stayed strong and true to their, their word, their people like zero shoes and innovate and Vivo barefoot. And, um, some of those Merrill has some, still has like some really minimal shoes. I tell people, find the shoe that fits you best because every person's foot's a little different. They all make them over different lasts. Um, I mean, they have this, as long as the shoe has the characteristics of no cushioning, no support, it's basically a protection on the bottom surface, something to keep it on. I'm happy. Honestly, it could be a pair of $10 Walmart Ked sneakers, but sometimes they don't last as long. I've, I've, and I had people who've kind of gone with the um, sort of knockoffs and sometimes the durability of them is not as, as good as some of these others. You pay a little bit more for them, but um, there's a number of great uh, minimal shoes. And, and uh, as I said, I don't like to really um, advocate or for one or, or another. I just think that they're all great. With sizing of the minimalist footwear, in your opinion, is it best to find a wide enough toe box that the lateral side of the pinky toe and the medial side of the big toe are not in contact with the shoe itself? Uh, I don't think it has to be not in contact, but it should contain it and be loose. Um, and, and most of the minimal shoes, that's part of one of the characteristics of them, is that they have a wide toe box. I'm curious to hear about some of the gadgets you get to work with um, in clinic that, that Bethany and I may not have access to in our normal day to day. So we have uh, accelerometers that we put around the ankles um, because we, we do have in our, so just step back for a minute. The Spalding National Running Center is a research lab and a clinical um, facility. And the clinic is upstairs. The research lab is downstairs. Downstairs has all the, you know, all the biomechanics tools, emotion analysis system and, and force plates. We have an instrumented treadmill, all the EMG, all of those tools. But in the clinic, um, we have uh, these uh, accelerometers, which basically correlate to how hard you're, you're landing. Um, they measure that shock wave I was telling you about. And that shock wave is related to the load rate of the ground reaction force that I mentioned earlier. So it's a kind of a surrogate measure and it's very easy clinically, you know, you wrap it around the ankle and we have a, a program that we can give them some feedback on so they can see, we can put, put it up on a screen in front of them and they can see how hard they're landing and we can put a line and say, we want you to reach this goal. Um, we don't have a lot of really fancy equipment. We, we do a lot of body weight support. I have a great, two great PTs, um, who have great manual skills. I, I have a lot of respect for the manual skills as well. Um, but we, we have a mirror, <laughs> which is, you know, very inexpensive, but great feedback. We also use a video camera because a mirror is only going to give you feedback of the front. So if you want to give feedback of the side because perhaps they're leaning too much or not leaning enough or they're not, you know, they're reaching out too far with their leg, you might want to give them side view or you might want to give them back view. We use a camera that we project onto a video, video screen in front of them. So those are some of the things that we use for our retraining in our clinic. Gotcha. Do you have any personal stories that come to mind of somebody that you like really helped change their life? Oh man, we, <laughs> there's a lot of them. Um, there's, I, I have, yeah, I have one that I think is, is really pretty remarkable. Um, this was a guy who was uh, in his mid twenties and he came to us and he had a pl really chronic, chronic plantar fasciitis had been, um, had had a number of different procedures had some surgical procedures, had all kinds of PT and nothing made him better. Um, and his feet were flat. They weren't completely flat, flat, but he didn't have great arches. And so, you know, he'd already had orthotics. He'd had everything you can imagine, the list. And, but nobody had addressed his foot strength. And so we took this individual and he wanted to run, but he just, he could not, this is what's so incredible about him. He could not even stand at a bus stop and wait for a bus. So he had a bike everywhere. He could bike, but he couldn't stand it for any prolonged time. He had a young child. He could not take care of her because he couldn't run after her. I mean, he was basically disabled at, at his, in his mid-20s, and he was a young, active guy. So, um, so we ended up putting him through our foot core program and strengthening his feet and slowly weaning him out of the orthotics. And this took months um, of work. And then we let him go, right? And so he was walking 
with minimal shoes and no, no foot problems or anything. We let him go for some months. And then he came back and he was, he had just accepted a position overseas in a few months um, at an academic institution and he wanted to run. And so we had felt like he was ready to start the running process because he was walking. He'd gotten out of the orthotics. He was in the minimal shoes and we were able to get him walk running um, in minimal shoes without orthotics and without plantar fasciitis. He was really a remarkable case. It took a year. I mean, sometimes it takes time and we let them go home and practice for a while. Can't keep people in therapy for a year. Um, the other woman that always comes to mind is this woman who had no toes. Um, she, basically had had some kind of an infection, um, you know, systemic infection, and it had, she had lost her toes as a result of it. And she was told she could never wear high heels again, and she could, you know, she was not going to be able to run, and, you know, she'd had all kinds of surgeries. And she's someone else that we worked with. Now, she, we did not convert her to a forfeit strike pattern because it was just too much with her losing her toes. But we put her into a pretty low-profile shoe and she landed kind of with a midfoot strike pattern. We taught, taught her to land softly. She was able to, through the retraining and through her foot strengthening, in particular, the foot strengthening, she could actually move her little stubs, which is what we were working towards. She had little stubs at the toes. Um, and she was able to wear her high heels to her daughter's wedding, which was, you know, for them, that's, that's huge. Um, and so she was another, like, story that makes you smile. That's great. We love that so much. What are you working on yeah. for the future? Um, let's see. I have, uh, uh, we're right now, we are engaged in a study at Fort Jackson. This is a, a little bit different. Um, we're not really looking at footwear. And um, we're measuring in 1,000 recruits, 500 males, 500 females, um, their impacts so we're using those accelerometers and we have some force treadmills down at Fort, Jack Fort Jackson. And um, we're looking at some very common activities in military recruits. So running, rucking with a pack and single and double leg landings off of a 12 and an 18 inch step. And we're measuring their angles um, and we're measuring their impact. So alignment and loading. And then we're going to follow them for a year. So that's going to help us to understand in the military because it's, the, one, the number one reason that they get medically discharged is for musculoskeletal injuries. So we're trying to identify what is it about their mechanics. And again, I think it comes down to well-aligned soft landings. It's very similar to what we do with our runners. Um, so if we can identify these factors, then hopefully we can help to instruct them early on and, and maybe prevent some of these injuries. So that's, that's a study we have ongoing. We are waiting to hear on a grant that got a 4% um, ranking. So I'm told that's pretty... Sure. I, I hate to say this out loud because <laughs> you just don't want to jinx yourself, but it's a study. And I've been trying for 10 years to get a minimal footwear study funded, honestly, um, in earnest. And there's just a real bias against minimal footwear and a real concern about injuring people. And um, But this particular study will be um, randomizing people into um, to a, a standard of care and some minimal footwear and looking at, at the... Um, the, the outcomes. So hoping that one will come through. Um, and then we have a number of other studies ongoing looking at different footwear between minimal and partial minimal and regular and, and what that does to mechanics because we think partial minimal may be different than minimal. I think they are different. Um, and looking at, you know, foot strength development in these different kinds of footwear and following those people for injury. So, um, yeah. That's it. That's all, that's all you have going on. <laughs> no, I, no, we, we actually are looking also, and we have a study looking at metatarsal stress fractures in runners. Um, so we have, yeah, we have a, a number of things going on, but they're all in that sort of genre of understanding mechanics and injuries and all really in lower extremity overuse injuries. Man, if I could be a fly on a wall in your lab. <laughs> Come join us. We'd love to have you. On my way. <laughs> We, you know, we got you on the call. We have to ask you about this. You started your career doing one thing, namely you were mostly orthotics and, yeah. and you were confronted with new information and you had to make some pretty interesting decisions on what you were going to continue to do. So we have to ask you about the importance of learning and growing during your career and, and using new information to make a pivot. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it wasn't hard for me. People ask that question and it was very 
it, it was easy. Um, I, I, I did start out uh, very much focused on adapting the foot, thinking that they're just some feet that can't tolerate the loads of walking and running and they need orthotics and they need a pair for their walking and their running shoes and, and their high heels. They've made some low profile for high heels. And, you know, I really kind of was in that mindset. Um, but it really was a, a culmination of um, a little bit of born to run, but it wasn't all born to run. It was part of our research looking at impacts and injury and looking at, you know, the fact that heel strikers get those impacts in their vertical ground reaction force and forefoot strikers don't. And people who run barefoot are forefoot strikers because that's the way we adapted to run. And maybe, so I started thinking about, you know, maybe this is really the way we should be running. Um, it's, it certainly is closer to the way that we were adapted to run. And so it kind of got me thinking differently and it was really kind of a natural evolution of thought for me. Um, so it wasn't hard for me to let go. It's funny because when I give talks sometimes, I've had students in the audience who were my PT students back when I was teaching them orthotics and all of the, you know, had that sort of dogma about, you know, motion control shoes. I was, I was making those recommendations as well and cushioning shoes. And they're like, man, you, you, you sound so different. So I do think it's important that you um, are open to evolving in the way that you think. I always say you've got to evolve in your relationships. You've got to evolve as a person. You've got to evolve in in your practice and 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 even in my research. And and that's the research is what sort of um, motivates me uh, to think differently, and also what I see clinically. Um, but I do believe that clinicians have a, a, an insight that people who aren't in the clinic do not, and sometimes it's hard for them to to accept it. Um, but you, as a clinician and a scientist, you have to always keep that objective scientific mind as well. So it's, it's, it can be tricky at times, but um, I think that it's, there's an advantage to, you know, living in the clinic as well. Mm, that's a wonderful answer. What a cool conversation to be a part of. If you had to leave the listener with one simple tip that they could apply in their lives, what would that be? I think trying to move more natural, if it comes to injuries, thinking about um, trying to move more naturally, uh, it being sort of the way to help prevent musculoskeletal injuries. And that means, you know, trying to um, not sit as much and spend time moving in multi directions because that's how we load our bodies in multi directions. Um, and that's how we were designed, we were adapted to. When we run, honestly, it's just in a straight line pretty much. So we don't have all that, that multidimensional. I want people to keep moving. I guess that's, that's one of the messages. And then the other message, I guess, that I really want to leave is that people who have children need to start them young and keep them in minimal shoes. Because I think if you're in minimal shoes, your feet will get stronger. If you're in minimal shoes, you'll probably run differently. Um, it'll promote more of a forefoot strike pattern. If you're on, if you're running in a forefoot strike pattern, it's going to, it's going to have an effect all the way up to your knees um, and get them into multidimensional sports as well. It's got to start with kids because otherwise we're paying for all these musculoskeletal injuries as adults. And I think that's probably the strongest message I can have is it's got to start with kids. Every one of my, I have grandkids now, every one of my grandkids, I've given them minimal shoes. The older ones, it's a little tougher because they're, you know, they want the, the, the trendy shoes, et cetera. The younger ones are easier. Um, but I have an eight year old that I've told him, these are the shoes you run really fast in. And I convinced him that his, and he tells me, he says, Mimi, these are my fast shoes. And I go, yep, you got those fast shoes. So, you know, if we can just, that's what needs to change, honestly, is starting then. That's amazing. We could not agree more. Dr. Irene Davis, thank you so much for coming on today. Can you tell the listener where they can go to connect with you? Sure. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Irene S. Davis. Um, and you can go to our website at uh, runsnrc.org. Um, and those are probably the best ways to connect with us. That's awesome. We will add that to the show notes. Dr. Irene Davis, thank you so very much for everything that you do. Um, we're so happy to have found your work and have noticed such a benefit in our own lives and the lives of the people that we work with and, and our clients. And so thank you so much for everything that you do and, and for sharing your message with us here on Boundless Body Radio. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Bethany and Casey. And I'm so glad that you guys have also drunk the Kool-Aid and keep up the good work and keep spreading the word. Absolutely. Can't stop. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was an honor to host you. Thanks. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.